Hi, my name is Brennan. Uh, I'm an engineer on the Brain team at Google, uh, and I work on cloud TPUs. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today. So uh, to begin with, I wanted to start with a little bit of motivation. Why, why TPUs? What are we here? Uh, this is a chart that I'm actually really quite fond of. It was recently published by OpenAI on their, their AI blog. And it traces over the last six years a number of seminal advancements that have happened in the field of deep learning. You can see on the left AlexNet, which is one of the ones that the models that really kicked off the deep learning revolution that we're experiencing today. As you go farther to the right, you can see more advanced vision models, but you also see whole new capabilities being unlocked. Translation, deep speech with audio uh, processing, neural machine translation, Dota 1v1 uh, you know, real-time game playing, and one of my favorites, AlphaGo Zero, uh, and Alpha Zero at the top right. And as deep learning has progressed, uh, you know, we've gotten more and more stuff that we're able to do with deep learning, which is really cool. But if you notice the y-axis of the plot, we need not just linearly increasing amount of compute, we need exponentially more compute. Unfortunately, just as we need exponentially more compute to do deep learning and uh, unlock this world of possibilities, Moore's law, or in particular, we're running into the end of Denard scaling. Single, ch single core clock performance, not improving very much. Uh, single thread performance IPC has basically hit a brick wall. Uh, even though we're still increasing the number of transistors, that trend is even starting to slow down more recently. And so we're really in between a rock and a hard place. And so we at Google, we realized that deep learning was so important. And we realized that it was so broadly applicable that we started investing in custom accelerators all the way back in 20, uh, even before 2015. So in the top left-hand corner is our first generation TPU. They're actually uh, these actual devices available in the um, booth over there if you're here in person. Uh, our first generation TPU is designed just for inference only, uh, so serving a model after it's been trained. And this is very important as we're deploying our first large-scale deep learning models at Google. But over time, we realized that training was just incredibly hard to do and to do it well. And so we started investing in our second generation TPU, which you see in the middle here. But we realized that in order to train bigger, more powerful models, we need to have these TPUs all linked together and focus on a single task in a very tight, cu tightly coupled fashion. And so these TPU devices are really designed to be deployed in TPU pods, which you can see on our top right-hand corner. But deep learning is advancing so rapidly, and there's so much possibilities for this field. We've been iterating extremely quickly. And at the bottom, our third generation TPU pod is over eight times faster and is available uh, just less than a year after uh, our second generation TPU pod. So we're really excited about all that we can do with TPUs, and we're excited to bring them to you as part of cloud TPUs. So that's our motivation for why we're here. Uh, this is what I'm going to be talking about today. The first is a life of a TPU program. Let's dig into what actually happens underneath the hood when you're running on a cloud TPU. The second part is, uh, what do you want to do? How do you actually program these TPU devices? And the third part, we'll spend a few minutes talking about one of the most common stumbling blocks that people run into when they're first using TPUs, which is how to keep them fed fast enough. They're just so fast. Uh, it really is an interesting engineering challenge uh, to feed data. So with no further ado, let's, let's dig right in. So if you want to run a program on a cloud TPU, well, you've got to provision your cloud TPU resources. Uh, and so let's talk a little bit about that. We show this picture of like one cloud TPU device. right? This is our second generation TPU device. Uh, but really, you never see them bear like this in our data center. These are specialized devices, and they're not general purpose. right? They're optimized just for machine learning. So in practice, we deploy them uh, often in what we call these pod configurations. So here you've got two middle racks of TPUs. You actually have an 8 by 8 or 64 total cloud TPU devices hooked together in this custom mesh network. And flanking these 64 TPU devices are actually 64 general purpose x86 machines in racks A and D. And their job is to feed and manage the TPU core. When you request one cloud TPU, you don't get just the TPU device itself. You also get the dedicated server for that TPU device. So one cloud TPU is actually two pieces of hardware, uh, often in two separate racks. Okay, So that's what the physical hardware is. How does this look like from like a cloud platform perspective? I'm going to talk about uh, TPUs on Compute Engine, but this applies for the other higher level products, which I'll talk about later in the talk. 
But uh, if you have a bunch of Compute Engine VMs uh, running in your private network, uh, if you're like me, you'll often store your data in Google Cloud Storage in a, in a storage bucket. This is, means it's available to multiple GCVMs. It's really cheap, uh, really scalable. Um, and when you want to allocate a cloud TPU, what happens is you get the dedicated cloud TPU host and TPU device. And in order to access them, we open up this network peering channel or this bridge. And once that's open, you can actually connect to it from your GCE VMs over TensorFlow's open source gRPC protocol. Now, in this picture, I'm showing one Compute Engine VM talking to one cloud TPU. But this is designed for maximum control and flexibility. So you can have multiple VMs talking to one cloud TPU. You can have one VM controlling multiple cloud TPUs or any combination you want. Cool. So how do you make that happen? Well, it's just a couple of gcloud commands away. gcloud compute instances create to create your GCVM. gcloud compute TPUs create to create your TPU. SSH in your VM, install TensorFlow, and you're off to the races. Well, not quite so fast. This is a sort of complicated command, so let's break it down a little bit. When you create a cloud TPU, you need to specify the version of TensorFlow installed. And the reason for that is because TensorFlow is not designed to work across different versions. If you're running a distributed TensorFlow cluster where one node is running TensorFlow 1.8 and one node is running TensorFlow 1.9, you're going to have a really bad day. The errors are absolutely unintelligible. Uh, so when you create a cloud TPU, you need to specify what version of TensorFlow you want to use. Additionally, you have to specify what network address range you want to give over to the TPU uh, so the TPU can be peered onto your network. Uh, and so you can see the list of routes. Um, pick a route that is unoccupied and, and go for that. Now, this is sort of involved and requires too much thinking. Uh, and so because I create a lot of cloud TPUs uh, as part of using them, I created a tool called CTPU. Now, CTPU is short for the Cloud TPU Provisioning Utility. Um, and if you just run CTPU up, it will basically set everything up for you. Launch a GCVM with TensorFlow pre-installed, create your cloud TPU, make sure it's peered up appropriately, and it will even SSH you into your GCVM, get you all ready to go. Uh, one thing to note, CTPU up is designed to be item potent. So if you have like a GCVM already running and your preemptible cloud TPU got preempted and you want to get things back into a working state, just rerun CTPU up, it'll SSH you back in. Cool. So now that we have the cloud resources, Let's actually run something on our cloud TPU, right? The whole point of this. I would be remiss if I did not emphasize the availability of our reference models for cloud TPUs. They span a wide variety of vertical domains. They're tested. Uh, they work really well. Some of them are even commented. It's really nice. Um, they're available on open source on GitHub and on our cloud TPU VMs. Uh, if, you want, if you provision a VM with CTPU, they're available on the file system at user share TPU. But this is the TensorFlow Cloud TPU deep dive. So we're going to ignore these big fancy scripts, and we're going to go down to the basis, uh, barest level. And so we're going to ignore those for the, for the rest of this talk. TensorFlow underneath its hood is a distributed graph execution engine. You build up a computational graph, often with Python. You pass it to the core TensorFlow distributed runtime. And you then execute that graph. So here we have a graph for a two-layer neural network. Um, and you can see the graph executing. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to build a simple graph and execute it uh, on a TPU. So this is a technical deep dive, so we're going to see a lot of code today. Uh, here is a very simple implementation of a linear regressor using TensorFlow. So we first describe our stateful nodes in our graph, our variables, w and b. These are the values we want to learn. We then take as input x and y. These are our training data and our training labels. We compute our predicted values, yp, with a matrix multiply, because x and y are batches of training values. Uh, we compute the loss by doing the squared error. Uh, and we want to minimize the loss, so we want to take advantage of TensorFlow's automatic differentiation and, and gradient update capabilities with our optimizer. We're using Atom, which is a variation on a momentum optimizer. Uh, highly recommended. So this is a linear regressor in low-level TensorFlow. How do you make it work on a TPU? Well, as it turns out, you don't change anything about your model. You keep that all the same. But what you need to do is you need to tell TensorFlow, hey, this part, make this go on the TPU. And so to do that, you pass your model function, the part that describes your model that you want to run on the TPU, you pass that to this TF contrib TPU rewrite. And what this will do is this will tell TensorFlow, put this part of the computational graph that I'm building onto the TPU. Once you've done that, you've now built a TensorFlow graph that is set up to run on a TPU. So now let's actually run it. 
uh, to run a computational graph in TensorFlow, you've got to create a TensorFlow session. But you can't pass the TPU name to the TensorFlow session constructor. It doesn't know how to, this standard open source TensorFlow, it doesn't know anything about cloud TPUs. So how do you make this work? Well, we have this thing in TensorFlow called cluster resolvers. And so we have a TPU cluster resolver where you pass that, the name of your cloud TPU, it will, on your behalf, contact the Cloud TPU API, figure out all the metadata about your Cloud TPU, and take care of all the uh, underlying details for you. So to create a TensorFlow session on a Cloud TPU, uh, you just create the cluster resolver, and you pass that to your session constructor. One thing to note, if you are using um, uh, CTPU or you're running on Kubernetes engine or other environments, the TPU cluster resolver is clever enough to inspect your environment uh, to figure out what your TPU name probably is. And so you can pass none, and it will try and figure out what, what actually should be there. So this is really convenient if you're sharing scripts across multiple people or sharing multiple cloud TPUs. Cool, so now that we have the session, uh, it's really straightforward to actually run our program on the cloud TPU. So here, we're doing random variables, because it's a toy example. We initialize the TPU system. Uh, and then we're sort of off to the races. Now one thing to note, this TPU initialized system is relatively heavyweight. So it's going to clear the entire TPU system state, uh, interrupts any running TPU programs that are running on the TPU devices, rebuilds the mesh network, um, and gets everything ready and clean for you to use. After that, uh, here we're going to run 100 steps of our training loop, uh, print out the losses, and, and shut down the system. So if you were to paste all this into foo.py and type python foo.py enter, you'll see your cursor blink for like 10 or 15 seconds, and then pff, 100 lines of loss will be printed out. So there's 10 or 15 seconds. That's initializing the TPU system. Uh, we're working on making that go a bit faster. Uh, but then after that, the computation runs really quickly. OK, so we just talked about how we programmed it from a low-level standpoint. But what actually happened inside the cloud TPU? Cloud TPUs, the TPU chips, they're not x86 chips. You can't run a standard program that you get out of GCC or Clang. And so in order to run a program on a cloud TPU, you need to have a compiler. And we use the XLA compiler. So what is XLA? XLA stands for Accelerated Linear Algebra. And it's this custom domain-specific compiler that takes in high-level, pure functional programs uh, in a language called HLO. And it outputs optimized binary programs for either CPUs, GPUs, or TPUs. Now, XLA, it has a few restrictions. It's a linear, high-level linear algebra-based language. You've got matrix multiplies, convolutions, uh, broadcast, reduce, sum, ops, uh, et cetera. But you don't have like, very branchy things like JPEG decode or other sorts of low-level uh, operations. Additionally, you have to, we require static shapes. But in exchange for these restrictions, we give you a few superpowers. The first one is operation fusion. Now, operation fusion, I think, is best illustrated in an example. If you're trying to write a program to sum three very large matrices, but your matrix library only has support for summing two matrices together. Well, you can work around that by doing A plus B and write that to a temporary value, and then do temporary plus C and get your eventual value. And you can do that, but it's a performance cost. You've got to read and write this temporary value. And it, it, it tends up being a very significant performance cost. XLA, because it sees your whole program and it optimizes everything, it can actually give you a, the optimal program without having you specify it. So that's one XLA superpower. And what this gives you is this means you can write your own composite operations. You aren't stuck into restricted kernels that are only uh, work well for, for certain hardware devices. You can invent your own primitives that then get compiled to high performance uh, programs that run on the TPU. Additionally, because XLA is a whole program optimizer and it's in this pure functional language, this means we can actually not just optimize the instructions that get executed on your processor, but this means we can optimize the memory layouts as well. Uh, so I think this most often comes up if you're doing convolutional networks on GPUs today. The recommendation was to do what's called channels first um, for most GPUs. You got much better performance if you did NCHW, right? Batch, uh, channels, height, width. Uh, but actually, on the latest Voltas with their tensor cores, uh, you get far better performance if you go back to the standard TensorFlow image format, which is channels last, NHWC. With XLA, you never have to worry about what is your memory shape formats or whatever. It will pick the optimal format for your hardware uh, based on what program you're trying to do, compile your program just for you. The final thing that XLA does is it does software pipelining really, really well. 
And we'll see why that's important a little bit later. So fine, XLA is great, cool. Uh, what does it matter to me? I'm a TensorFlow programmer, right? I don't want to write XLA programs. Well, that's why we have what's called the TensorFlow to XLA bridge. And what this will do is this will take a TensorFlow graph, and this will convert some of your uh, part of your graph to be an XLA program. So how this works is we've got these TF to XLA kernels. So you've marked out in the rewrite for TPU um, function, you've marked out a subset of your TensorFlow graph to run on the TPU. Uh, and so what we'll do is we'll go through op by op and translate them into portions of the XLA program. Here are the XLA graph on the right-hand side. For add, it's a straightforward one-to-one -one mapping. But for softmax, there is no softmax, what's called HLO op. And so instead, the kernel builds up the softmax operation from the set of primitives. What this means is that if you want to write your own operation that's different than softmax, you can build it up from your own primitives, and it will run just as fast uh, as softmax modulo the performance characteristics of your computation. Right? There's nothing special. Once we finish translating the whole program into the XLA graph, the TensorFlow runtime will execute the XLA compiler on the XLA program that it built up for you, replace that subset of your graph with this custom XLA program, and then it will run the graph just like uh, you'd expect. OK, so that tells us like, what bits of software are involved. But like, let's dig one level deeper. What actually happened on the TPU chips? In order to understand that, we need to understand what are the TPU chips. We need to see what's going on with them. So one TPU chip, uh, this is a V2 chip. The V3 chip has uh, double the amount of HBM uh, and is a little bit faster in the core. But in a V2 chip, you've got two cores. Each core is identical, so let's double click on one of the cores and, and see what's going on. You've got three key components. You've got the scalar unit, you've got the vector unit, and the matrix unit. So the scalar unit, that's typically used for loop indexing, making sure if you're doing a loop n times, you do it n times, uh, computing addresses in memory, things like that. The vector unit uh, is very sophisticated. It has support for float32. This is IEEE float32. Int32, this funky format bfloat16, which we'll hear about in a minute. Uh, through software, it can support a lot of other formats like uh, Int64, Complex64, et cetera, where you've got an Int32 real part and Int32 imaginary, et cetera. Um, and it uh, so lets you do all sorts of things, compute transcendentals, things like that. But the real heart of the cloud TPU is the matrix unit. So this is a special hardware circuit design uh, called a systolic array. And so the matrix unit is a 128 by 128 matrix multiply systolic array. And it is optimized for machine learning. It takes in as input bfloat16, or float32 values, computes the multiplication in this format bfloat16, sums up the values in float32, and uh, the output is then in float32. So for those of you who need a bit of a refresher course on IEEE floating point formats, I know I certainly did, uh, here's my brief handy dandy guide. So IEEE defined what's called single precision floating point format. And this uses 32 bits and is often called FP32. You've got one sign bit. You've got eight bits of exponent. And then the rest of the 32 bits, so you've got 23 bits left, that's the mantissa or the significant. That's sort of like how precise of a number you're able to specify. Now IEEE also defined uh, a 16-bit half precision fl floating point format. And this is sort of the very natural extension uh, from FP32. You take a little few bits away from the exponent, you take a few bits away from the mantissa, bada bing, bada boom, you've got 16-bit floating point format. One thing to note, however, is that the range ends up being quite drastically reduced. And when you train neural networks, you'll find that if you want to use float 16, and there are a lot of good reasons why you want to use a 16-bit floating, floating point format, you have to do a bunch of clever tricks in order to make sure that it keeps training. If you, um, most times when you train a neural network in FP16 without no, any modifications, your losses will explode to infinity, or you'll get not a number, NANs, or your, your, your model just won't train. You'll have vanishing gradients that go down to zero. And this is because neural networks really need a large range in order to often train effectively. We recognize this at Google because we train a lot of neural networks. And so we did a bunch of studies across a broad range of neural networks, and we realized that if you have a different floating point format, this can often be a drop in replacement. So we invented on the Google Brain team the bfloat16 format. And this is short for brain floating point format in 16 bits. And this preserves the exact same range of FP32, 
but does it in 16 bits. And as it turns out, this is often a drop-in replacement for FP32, but because it's only in 16 bits, it takes half the space. That means your memory feels twice as large. This means that your memory bandwidth is twice as fast. Uh, so it's a really cool performance optimization that we've done in TPUs. Cool. So now that we know about floating point formats, let's talk a little bit more about the matrix multiply unit. This is a 128 by 128 matrix multiply unit. So does that mean that my model has to be composed entirely of 128 by 128 matrix multiplies? Well, the answer is no. Uh, so here's a study uh, on ResNet 50. And I took a single cloud TPU device that you can run today, and I basically sweeped uh, a number of different batch sizes. Uh, and this is per core batch size. So remember, a TPU device has eight cores. Um, so this is our per core batch size. Uh, as you go from one to eight, you'll see performance is increasing very significantly. Uh, we reach our peak performance at batch size 128. So what's going on here? The XLA compiler is able to realize that if your batch size is 128, that fits really nicely with the 128 by 128 matrix multiply unit. But to really understand what's going on, uh, I think it's easiest if, you, if we plot it on a log scale, right? We're doubling the per core batch size on the, y -ax on the x axis. So let's turn the y axis also into a logarithmic scale. And here, it's a little bit easier to see. We've got two distinct trends. It's a piecewise uh, performance layer. Uh, we increase performance practically linearly uh, from batch size 1 to batch size 8. But after that, performance improves only a little bit. What this means is that XLA is able to do a really good job software pipelining all the optimizations after you get to batch size 8 on a cloud TPU. Now, this is just on ResNet 50. There have been a variety of other models that work really, really well at even smaller batch sizes, depending upon whatever things are. So uh, one question we often get is, do I need to have my model be batch size 120, or do you need to have my model be like 128 everywhere? The answer is, of course, no. Um, XLA takes care of getting you the optimal code generation across a variety of different model architectures and batch sizes. OK, so now that we know a little bit about the chip, now we can really delve down and figure out what actually happened in our linear regressor program on a TPU. So the first step is we load the weights into our matrix multiply unit. After that, we stream through our training data into the matrix multiply unit, compute the matrix multiply, and stream the output out. Now, I mentioned about Operation Fusion. XLA is actually able to, in parallel, stream the values into the vector unit, compute the loss or the activations or whatever other operations your model requests, and stream those values out in parallel. As a result, you get really high performance, and you're really able to take advantage of all the capabilities on the chip. So we've been delving really deep into one single program. But as it turns out, all we've been doing is running on a single core of our cloud TPU device. TPUs are designed to be networked together, and they're designed to be parallel devices. So multi-core execution is very important. As it turns out, because we have this custom network and because we've designed these things from the ground up for parallel compute, uh, it's actually really easy to make these go not just on a single core, but across cores up to a whole pod. All you need to do is you need to take your optimizer and wrap it in this TPU cross shard optimizer. What this means is this coordinates the optimization routines that are being run uh, on your model across all the different compute cores in a TPU device all the way up to a whole TPU pod. After that, you just say batch parallel instead of rewrite. So this is a, a higher level API. Specify the number of shards, and done. You're off to the races. That is all you need to do. So we've been walking through how to write a TPU program. We've been using low-level TensorFlow. This is because we wanted to see what's going on underneath the hood. But really, no one <laughs> writes low-level TensorFlow on TPUs. Uh, it is too verbose. Uh, the low-level APIs were optimizing and changing relatively frequently. It means you're locked into a, a TPU program. Um, there's a lot of features and performance optimizations that are also very hard to write in low-level TensorFlow. So how do we program TPUs? The first thing I want to tell you about is TPU Estimator. So TensorFlow is designed to go across a wide variety of platforms and go from research to production. And many of our production users have realized that many of their problems can be, be decomposed into two key aspects. The first aspect is describing your machine learning model. Is this random forest, a convolutional neural network, a deep neural network? And these models are often generic across the input data. So you write a second input function that describes what data you want to load in. And by decomposing this into these two distinct parts, uh, 
You then pass these functions to the core estimator logic, and the estimator takes care of all the nitty gritty things like handling failures, checkpointing, exporting for inference, a whole bunch of other really nice things. And so the TensorFlow Estimator API is used by a vast majority of production teams at Google. And so we wanted to make it really easy to take your model and go from estimators to TPU estimators, uh, whether you're running on CPUs and GPUs before or TPUs. So here's a code sample uh, of actually a full working estimator-based model. So uh, I've sort of masked out the bottom. On the top, this is identical code if you're running with standard estimators or TPU estimators. At the top of the model function, we describe our deep neural network. We have our optimizer. On the right-hand side, we've got our input function. So we're loading data from a path on disk. Uh, we're parsing out our TF record values and returning a data set that has uh, uh, the, the training data we want to train on. The only changes are in the bottom half. And aside from a few mechanical changes, changing standard estimator to TPU estimator and standard estimator spec to TPU estimator spec, there's only two small changes. <coughs> Excuse me. The first one is, as we saw before, you'll want to run across multiple cores on a TPU device. Uh, your TPU device is way faster when they all work together. So you've got to use that cross shard optimizer. The only other thing is to pass the TPU cluster resolver that we saw before so that estimator knows how to find your TPU on the network. That's it. Uh, it's really easy to go from uh, an estimator that runs on CPUs or GPUs to an estimator, to TPU estimator that will run on TPUs all the way up to whole TPU pod. But I want to actually call out one thing. We on the TensorFlow team, we want to go wherever you want to go for your machine learning workloads. This means CPUs, this means GPUs, and this means TPUs. And so we've worked very hard so that if you just pass use TPU is equal to false to a TPU estimator model, you will get identical behavior to standard estimators that run on all your other platforms. So once you migrate to TPU estimator, it is very easy to run on any platform you want, CPUs, GPUs, or TPUs. So let's dig one level deeper and give you a bit of intuition about this abstraction. The model function is what runs on the TPU. Uh, this gets compiled by XLA and uh, goes really, really fast. The input function runs on the x86 CPU hosts that are attached. Um, and now that you know sort of a little bit of intuition about what's going on, you can start doing funny optimizations. Say, for example, you have some input preprocessing that logically belongs in the input function, but it's super computationally expensive, and the CPUs just can't keep up. Well, you can put that at the top of your model function and have that compiled and run on the TPU. And as long as uh, you know, it compiles for the TPU, you can get all the performance advantages of running on the accelerator device. By contrast, if you have something that can't compile for the TPU, go ahead and hoist that into your input function with one key restriction. If you need to take the gradient of it, that has to happen in the model function. It does have to go onto the TPU because that's the way we do the cross shard coordination is on the TPU device itself. We totally keep the CPUs out of the path because that's how we get the amazing performance that we see on TPUs. TPU estimator is designed uh, and is in designed for production reliability, scalability, and performance. It automatically handles failures, so it does uh, automatically uh, saving checkpoints and restoring from the checkpoints. It has a very stable API that doesn't change very much, even though it still is in contrib. There's very little boilerplate. You just define your model and your input function and uh, construct your estimator. You're off to the races. But we've heard from a lot of folks that although they really like TPU estimator, we've heard some other folks that they don't quite like it. They want a little bit more flexibility. They want a little bit more control. And so I'm really excited to announce to you today that Keras on cloud TPUs will be available in TensorFlow 110. Our release candidates for TF110 just got uh, first release candidates dropped just yesterday. Um, but we're really excited about what this brings to our cloud TPU users. So let's talk about how this Keras integration actually works. Here is a convolutional uh, network uh, running on a standard Keras model that runs on CPUs or GPUs. Uh, let's convert it to run on TPUs. OK, done. I didn't change anything. You write your model exactly as you did before. The only thing you have to do is you pass your existing standard Keras model to keras-support.tpu model. And you pass in a couple extra things like your distribution strategy and the cloud TPU you want to run on. 
this will return to you a TPUified Keras model. After that, that's it. Use it just like a standard Keras model, passing in NumPy data, passing a data set, do whatever you want with it, call fit, call fit generator, uh, call evaluate. Use it just like a standard Keras model. We're really excited about the flexibility that this sort of uh, an API um, and Keras brings. Keras is a really great API and framework for machine learning. A lot of people really like it. Now it's even easier than ever before to go uh, to TPU hardware. So now that we have multiple APIs, well, how do you choose which one? If you already have a model that's using estimators, definitely migrate just to TPU estimator. This will give you production uh, grade performance. Um, it's reliable. It's very robust. Uh, works very well. If you have a lot of Keras models, definitely try out our new experimental Keras integration. Um, this is a lot more flexible, um, and people really like it uh, who have tried it so far. But if you haven't started, uh, I want to give you a bit of intuition. If you're starting something from scratch, I want to give you a bit of intuition as to which API you should choose. One thing to note, though, the same team is developing both TPU Estimator and Keras. And so although there are current advantages to one versus the other, expect feature convergence over time. For now, though, TPU Estimator scales to whole pods with zero code changes. It's super fast, uh, has all the performance optimizations in it. Keras, by contrast, uh, is a little bit more flexible and easy to use. Error messages are often a little bit easier to understand. Uh, it supports non-static shapes uh, through a bunch of dynamic recompilation underneath the hood for you. Uh, so we're really excited about both these two APIs. If you want more flexibility, go with Keras. If you're in production, you want peak performance, go with TPU Estimator. Now, I've gone through the mechanics of how do you actually program these cloud TPU devices. But uh, as we've migrated a huge number of customers from other hardware platforms to TPUs, and we've done this both internally at Google and externally as part of Google Cloud, we've gleaned a number of best practices and tips. So I'd like to walk you through a few of them today. Far and away, the best advice we can give you is, if possible, start with a reference model. These are well-tuned. They're uh, reasonably clean. They are uh, tested to converge reliably. So our ResNet 50 implementation, if you train it on ImageNet, you're going to get 76.2% top one accuracy every single time. These are high quality both in the machine learning and in the performance. But if you can't, and you have an existing code base that you've invested in for your machine learning model, we have a workflow that often works pretty well. Step one is on your existing hardware, port to estimators. This often results in a bunch of code getting deleted that you sort of manually were doing, like checkpoints and things like that. Um, and then at this step, once you've completed your port to estimator, be sure to verify convergence. This is often a mistake that people skip. Once you're sure that your model is working exactly as you expect, then do the mechanical change from estimator to TPU estimator. Start with use TPU as false and make sure that the mechanical changes work just fine. And after that, turn on TPUs and you're off to the races. And finally, be sure to optimize performance. You won't see the full benefit of cloud TPUs if you ensure they're not being bottlenecked by your CPU input pipeline. Now, this is a very common workflow migrating existing models to TPU hardware. But we've actually seen a lot of people just start on cloud TPUs natively. There are a number of really compelling advantages for that. In addition to being cheaper, most importantly, they're fast. And so you can iterate much more quickly than you can on any other hardware platform that we, that we see. So if you want to bring up a brand new model from scratch and you're not starting from one of our existing models, be sure to iterate very uh, regularly. As you, it's much easier to debug a few lines of code delta than it is a thousand line model function with a very sophisticated network. If you're trying to figure out you know, your shape Im inference, um, you need static shapes and the shape inference isn't working right, much easier to figure that out if you just changed a couple lines than if you have to hunt through a thousand line uh, model function. So iterate regularly. Uh, as a bonus tip, make sure to optimize your input pipeline performance early. This just is gas on the iteration speed and just uh, helps you go a whole lot faster. Once you've got a basic thing working, usually on a single cloud TPU device, take advantage of what is the magic of TPUs, which is you can scale. Scale these out to whole fleets to run hyperparameter searches in parallel, or scale up to train your models uh, super, super fast, get results, turn around, optimize your model, and, and, and uh, uh, develop your system. 
So those are some of the high-level best practices. Let's dig down again into the nitty-gritty. When you're developing models on cloud TPUs, some of us aren't perfect coders, and we end up putting bugs in our systems. And so I want to walk you through some common errors that people sometimes stumble upon so that you have an intuition for what's going on um, and how to solve these common issues that come up. So the first one is uh, unimplemented error. This file scheme local is not implemented. It tells you the file that it's uh, trying to do, and you'll like grep through your code, and you're like, no, where do I reference slash temp? What the heck's going on? This is very common because estimators, and therefore TPU estimator, handles software failures. It handles hardware failures. It handles other problems in your system. And so as a result, it requires a checkpoint directory so it can save and restore training progress. And if you don't provide it a checkpoint directory, it will helpfully create one for you on slash temp. Now, when you try and run this on a cloud TPU, the cloud TPU is a totally different device. It cannot read or write to slash temp on your GC VM. This would totally break all the security abstractions. Like, it just doesn't work. And so what's happening here is that uh, it's trying to do the, just that. So the solution is to whenever you're running a TPU estimator model on a cloud TPU, be sure to specify the model directory. That's where your checkpoints get saved to and they get restored from. Uh, you need to set the checkpoint directory to be someplace on a shared file system that both the cloud TPU and your Python process can read and write to. This is often GCS, Google Cloud Storage. Another common error message uh, is the following. You get this not found error, no registered where op kernel for XLA TPU JIT. Uh, so what's going on here? Well, remember that TensorFlow graph gets converted into an XLA graph, which then gets compiled and runs on the TPU device. And what's happening is we don't have a, a TF to XLA kernel for the where op. Okay? And so uh, what you need to do is see if you can restructure your program, your uh, TensorFlow graph, to not use these ops that we don't have a translation for into XLA. Alternatively, you could implement uh, the TF to XLA kernel, because all these are fully open sourced. You can uh, implement your own. Or file a bug, uh, and, and we'll see if we can prioritize getting those op kernels implemented. OK, another common error message that people might see is the following. Uh, not found error, no registered cast op kernel for XLA TPU JIT. Aha, well, we've seen this one before, right? Well, as it turns out, it's a little subtle. The final parenthetical is the key uh, difference. The op kernel was found. So there is a TF to XLA op kernel, but the attributes didn't match. So let's dig into what are the attributes. You've got our destination type of DT int 16, our source type, DT float, uh, and the device. Now, the device is fine. The issue is actually uh, DT int 16. TPUs don't support int 16. They only support float 32 or DT float, um, int 32, et cetera. So the solution here is to, instead of trying to cast to int 16, leave it as float or cast to int 32. If you want to see what ops a priori before you get these error messages, if you want to see uh, what ops are likely compatible with TPUs or not, we have this really cool TPU compatibility checker. And the, tool, uh, the tools page uh, documents really uh, clearly how you can use it. Now one thing to note, uh, we're constantly adding new kernel implementations and supporting new data types, et cetera. And so the source of truth um, uh, is often the compiler uh, and the TensorFlow version you're actually using. Uh, so uh, beware that there is some delta between what the tool says and, and reality. The final error message that people often stumble over is the following. Not found error, op type, not registered, pyfunk. Now remember, Cloud TPUs are this distributed computation device. Your Python runs on your GCE VM, um, but the Cloud TPU has no Python available to it on the CPU. Uh, it's just a C++ binary, as it turns out. Um, and so you can't use PyFunks on your Cloud TPU. However, with a little bit of cleverness, you can use PyFunks in your input function, like we are here, our input pipeline task zero. You can do that with a, a, a technique I'm going to show you in the next section, which brings me to feeding a TPU program. So I want to take a step back before we delve into this and actually remark upon a trend that is happening across TPUs. In fact, if you look at NVIDIA's Volta GPUs, they're phenomenal accelerators. They're really fast, and NVIDIA's done a great job working on them. And if you try to run a fast model on NVIDIA Volta GPUs, like ResNet 50 on a DGX1, you'll find that the local SSD can't keep up. We've seen this in TensorFlow as we benchmark on a wide variety of hardware platforms, that unless you have 
a high-performance storage system, your accelerators are actually going to sit idle, waiting for data to be fed in. And in this case, just the raw throughput of the SSD can't keep up. If you have the data in memory on your RAM disk, you're fine. But if it's on the SSD and you've got a cold RAM disk or a cold buffer cache, you're not. And if you try and optimize around this, um, it can often be quite pricey. So one company found that the storage costs alone on a non-GCP platform was more expensive than the entire cloud TPU solution, including storage, including the cloud TPUs themselves. In this case, it was preemptible, including the GCVMs to drive it. So the entire GCE solution was cheaper than just storage on this other platform. The GPUs could be completely free. The compute could be completely free. The VMs, the compute, everything could be completely free. Just the storage alone was more expensive. And so to tell you about how you can feed uh, fast accelerators, TPUs, but also GPUs on Google Cloud Platform. This is available, all these are available in standard TensorFlow. Uh, I want to walk you through three ways that you can do this. So the first and most common way is Google Cloud Storage. This is a distributed file system uh, that is optimized for both extreme scale and shockingly low cost. Uh, oops. Uh, the next one that people often do is use Compute Engine. This allows you to stream data from either local SSDs um, or in-memory data structures. Uh, this is where you can use PyFunks to pre-process your data. You can stream the data from GCVMs into a cloud TPU. And finally, I'm really excited to announce a brand new integration coming in TensorFlow 1.10 over the next few weeks. That is Cloud Bigtable. Cloud Bigtable, for those of you who are not familiar, is a wide row structured storage system. Uh, scales out horizontally uh, and has amazing performance both for low latency as well as high throughput, uh, which is relatively unique for a system uh, of this caliber. So to walk you through what these all are like and how to use them, uh, let's dig right in. Cloud storage is definitely the default choice. It's a familiar abstraction, files on a distributed file system. Uh, people are easy, it's very easy to work with, has very nice UIs and integrations with a wide variety of different tools. I have some tips and tricks for you to make sure you can get the best performance out of Google Cloud Storage. The first one is make sure you select regional storage. So not multi-regional, not near line, not cold line, or else you're going to get a nasty bill at the end of the uh, month because uh, those are uh, end up being far more expensive for use with high performance compute devices like cloud TPUs. Additionally, make sure that your data is in the exact same region as your accelerators, US Central 1 or uh, Europe West 4 or in uh, Taiwan. Additionally, GCS is optimized for high throughput but not low latency. And so in order to work around, in order to achieve high performance, you need to batch your data into large, often TF record files. Uh, we found that 100 megabytes to 200 megabytes works very well to allow, it's a sort of a sweet spot between parallelism and uh, throughput of the files. To handle all this complicated data loading and parallelism and software pipelining, uh, TF data makes it very easy. So let's walk through an example. Uh, here we're uh, loading um, a set of TF record files in this case from a GCS path. Uh, we're reading 32 files in parallel. Um, and after that, we've constructed a data set that we can then pre-process or do whatever we want. Uh, and this works, of course, for cloud TPUs, but GPUs on GCE, et cetera. That's it. Just two lines of code. It's pretty easy. The next one I want to talk about is Compute Engine VMs. We have a few different ways that you can feed data into cloud TPUs at high performance. The first one is the streaming files data set. This is a software pipeline data infeed that you can read from local disk, often local SSD, because that's faster than persistent disk SSD. Um, uh, but you can feed from both. Uh, and with streaming files, you can actually use uh, arbitrary Python to pre-process the data using PyFunks or otherwise to stream it in uh, into the cloud TPU. Now, often we found if you do try and use PyFunks, that will be a performance bottleneck. But for certain models, uh, this absolutely makes a lot of sense. It's also great as uh, an experimentation or getting started tool. Additionally, we have a second method, which is this RPC op. Uh, you can actually load data from any arbitrary gRPC server as long as you implement a small gRPC interface. This works really well when data is being generated on the fly, especially if data is stored in memory, for example, in reinforcement learning type style workloads. So to give you an illustration of what's going on, you have a Compute Engine VM, and you're passing the streaming files data set 
from the VM, uh, streaming the data from the VM into the cloud TPU. Now, TensorFlow is designed as a distributed execution engine, so you can actually stream data from multiple GC VMs into one cloud TPU, or of course, you can use the RPC app for one or more GC VMs. To take a look at some code to see how you'd actually do this, uh, here's an example of the streaming files data set. We're reading from a local path on disk. In this case, we're doing TF records. But if you wanted to do uh, more complicated pre-processing, uh, you can pass in a few extra arguments, uh, and you're off to the races. One thing to note, you do have to configure your TPU cluster resolver a little bit differently in order to ensure that the cloud TPU knows where to find your GCVM uh, to pull the data from. And finally, I'd like to talk a few minutes about Cloud Bigtable. Uh, in some benchmarks, uh, Cloud Bigtable has been shown to be over 10 times faster than Google Cloud Storage. So it's this amazing performance uh, system. And because it's a database, a uh, high-scale database, you can have a flexible schema, and you can query your data in a variety of different patterns. So it's really valuable for experimentation or other sorts of workloads. Additionally, if you're generating your data on the fly from, say, multiple worker VMs as you're doing like self-play in a reinforcement learning algorithm, you can stream the data into Bigtable, and you don't have to create your own batch record files or anything like that. Bigtable handles all of that for you automatically. Uh, I have a sample script available on GitHub for how to load a TF records into Bigtable, but it's designed to be easily flexible uh, and rewritten to stream data of whatever format you want into Bigtable. Getting data out of Bigtable is also really easy with TF data. You create a big table client, uh, you open the table, uh, and then you can scan um, rows either by range or by prefix, specifying whatever column families and columns you want out. This gives you a data set that you can use just like normal. So with TF data, it's very flexible and very easy to switch between all these different data sources while maintaining your pre-processing uh, uh, operations, et cetera, lower, lower down in your input function. Now that we have choices, well, how do you choose? Um, this walks through sort of the pricing of these different storage solutions. So Google Cloud Storage is two cents per gigabyte per month and is the cheapest. Um, the other uh, storage systems uh, have different prices as listed. Uh, Google Cloud Storage, you don't pay unless you're uh, pulling data out of it. So the hourly overheads are, are zero, which is really nice. On the second half of the slide um, of this table, I walk through sort of a pricing example. If you have a one terabyte training data set and you train on it for 10 hours, here's your cost for just the storage and for everything all in, whether using a standard cloud TPU or a preemptible cloud TPU. So that's an overview of our uh, three main areas. What's going on underneath the hood of a cloud TPU? Uh, how to program a cloud TPU using our new APIs? And finally, how to feed data. But I want to take this all back to uh, really the whole purpose which is you. Uh, we've talked about how to use Cloud TPUs on Compute Engine, but you can also use it on Cloud ML Engine or Kubernetes Engine. Cloud ML Engine makes it very, very easy to switch between CPUs, GPUs, or TPUs. Just change one flag for your model and, your, and, uh, and, and re resubmit your job. Kubernetes has this new integration where you can request a Cloud TPU to be provisioned and deprovisioned for you uh, as part of your pods when your pods get launched and deleted on the, uh, on the Kubernetes cluster. So these higher level APIs are really nice. They handle a lot of the convenience. You don't have to worry about network ranges, et cetera. So really excited to have all three of these different engines available to you for your workloads for whatever your style of work is. But I want to take a step back and realize, well, what are TPUs really? And I want to sort of take a different interpretation of things. This is a plot that shows the performance of a model as it scales across a single cloud TPU device up to a whole second generation cloud TPU pod of 64 devices. Uh, and the dotted line is perfect scaling, and the blue line is the observed performance. Now, this is a cool chart that shows, like, yes, woohoo, our custom mesh network is super fast. But what this means for you is that you write your model on a single cloud TPU device. And with zero code changes, you scale it up to a whole cloud TPU pod. And you get your answers linearly times faster in many cases. This means that TPUs are like a time machine. Instead of having to wait days or weeks, you can iterate in hours or even faster. And this just supercharges both ML research as well as ML product development. 
We're bringing all this technology to you as we optimize from our storage systems, our compute, our network, and our TPU devices. We're bringing all of this great technology to you. The sky's the limit. Develop your applications ethically. Conduct your research responsibly. But I'm super excited to see what you all are building. Thank you very much for your time today. A few extra sessions. Third time's the time. There's a few extra sessions available uh, that you cannot see. There we go. Um, that are also relevant to TPUs if you're interested. And uh, I'm happy to take questions over off to the side because I am way out of time. Thank you.